Uh, as Polly mentioned, I work for the U.S. Forest Service in the southern region. Um, that, the southern region is from Virginia down to Florida over to Texas, so those 13 states. And I manage something called the Southern Pine Beetle Prevention Program for that, for the region. The Southern Pine Beetle is a, a native insect to the south. It's, um, as you know, it's not known to have, to have been in Long Island before, but it's, I guess, first was first detected in 2014. Um, actually, we have issues with Southern Pine Beetle right now from Long Island, New Jersey, in the south, and then in somewhat in Central America as well. So um, it's popping up in, in many, many places. But it um, traditionally can be found um, impacting loblolly, shortleaf, and pitch pine. Those are the most susceptible species. Um, it can also attack and kill eastern white pine. We consider slash and longleaf pines uh, less susceptible. Uh, we, we think longleaf is, is mostly tolerant to southern pine beetle except in extreme cases. Um, it can also attack and kill spruce. However, I, I generally think of when, when southern pine beetle is attacking your spruce trees, that's when you know you, you have a problem because it's you have a lot of uh, insects out on the landscape and they're looking for any type of host that, that they can get into. It's not un, unheard of that southern pine beetle gets into spruce, it's just not as common as uh, getting into your pine. Um, it in, southern pine beetle impacts forests in what we call um, spots, so in clusters of trees, and you'll hear me reference spots quite a bit today. It's the Initial attack is like a, just one or two trees, and then that um, infestation grows in a cluster of trees throughout your forest. Um, these spots grow like that because the southern pine beetle um, have a very well-developed uh, pheromone communication system. That's how they can mass attack a tree. They're a very small insect. It takes hundreds of them to attack and kill a, a tree. And so they use this pheromone communication, and that's how a spot grows uh, with this communication uh, system. And then we consider thinning to be the best option for trying to prevent damage from this insect. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. The obligatory uh, southern pine beetle picture. Um, Polly did bring some southern pine beetle over here. You'll, if you pick up the jar, you'll see that uh, very small insect. Uh, my eyes are starting to fade, so sometimes in the field here, even, even I can't really identify them um, very easily. You need kind of a hand lens or a microscope to be able to identify these things in the field sometimes. Um, but if you um, do have southern pine beetle, these are the kinds of things that you would see either from the air. Uh, the far left picture there is kind of that spot that you would see if you were doing an aerial survey in an area that had southern pine beetle. If you were on the ground, uh, the middle picture there shows these pitch tubes where the beetles bore into the trees. And uh, the tree's defense for southern pine beetle is to try to pitch these beetles out or uh, like resin flow that encapsulates the beetles. So if you only have 10 or 20 beetles attacking at once, the tree can oftentimes overcome that attack. However, if you have hundreds or thousands of beetles attacking at once, uh, the tree usually is going to lose that battle. And then if you were to peel back the bark, um, as Polly has a, an example over there on the, on the table, if you peel back that bark, you see these serpentine galleries under the bark where the, where the female winds through the, uh, under the bark and lay, lays the eggs. Um, as you know, there is an, a southern pine beetle issue here on Long Island in the eastern part of the, of the island in the Pine Barrens area. Um, it was first detected in 2014, although I gather from the, the, local, the locals here that they, they think that it must have been here somewhat before that. Um, current infestation levels greater than 5,000 acres uh, in, these, in these areas that you're probably more familiar with than, than me, being that I'm from uh, North Carolina. Uh, local impact is the altered uh, community composition, change in the, in the structure, uh, accelerating that succession from a pine-dominated forest to a more oak-dominated forest, um, increased hazard with these dead trees, 
Um, last time we were up here, we did a field trip, and um, you know, we were out there in the, um, <clears throat> some areas that have been killed by southern pine beetle, and I was, I was really trying to push people along from uh, standing underneath of those spots because uh, it was kind of a windy day, and, and the trees will, will topple over and limbs will fall out. Uh, and then a potential for altered fire behavior and hazard in these areas that have been impacted by southern pine beetle. And Ken is going to talk more about that in the next presentation. Um, if you have southern pine beetle um, and you have these spots, most of the spots that are small will kind of die out on their own. However, if a spot starts to get a little bit larger, say an acre in size, um, and you don't do any type of suppression in there, the spots can get quite large. Um, as you see here, um, the, the spot was ten, got 10 times larger, and they didn't do any suppression in this particular area. And that's um, not completely uncommon for that to happen if you don't do any suppression. Uh, one of the best suppression methods is um, what we call cut and remove. And it's exactly what um, it sounds like. You go into an infested area, into a spot, you cut the currently infested trees and a buffer strip of uninfested trees. You leave some uh, trees that were vacated already. The southern pine beetle have already come out of those trees. Um, this only works, however, if there's a timber market available in your area for someone to come and buy these trees or else it's uh, quite expensive to do. Uh, so I'm not gonna spend much time on it, um, but cut and leave is also a very effective method for um, suppressing these individual spots. That's where you go in and you cut the currently infested trees and leave them there on the, on the site. Um, you can, the advantage of this is you can get to a lot of spots. You can even do this with hand crews, so if the site's not very accessible, uh, you can do that. You're not removing any of the beetles, not getting any revenue from the trees, and there is some issue with regenerating these particular spots back to a community, pine community, that you would, you would want. Uh, it's not really suitable for very large spots, as, as you all have uh, found. Um, you really can't get ahead of these very large spots with, with cut and leave, especially with, um, if you're doing it with hand crews. There we go, and uh, New York State DEC has been doing quite a bit of this cut and leave um, since uh, 2015 and 2016. Um, they're doing monitoring, cut and leave, suppression, uh, thinking about restoration efforts in these areas, uh, doing some hazard tree development, particularly along um, roadsides where if you have a lot of these dead trees on your roadsides, they will eventually start to fall over and that's going to be an important safety hazard. Um, <clears throat> they're doing some forest health demonstration plots that I think we're going to see later today um, where they're thinning and they have plans to burn. And I think that's largely based on some of the work that we've done in the, in the south uh, to try to prevent um, southern pine beetle. So as Polly mentioned, I, ma I managed the southern pine beetle prevention program in the south. And uh, this program was started back in 2003 at the request of Congress um, after our last major southern pine beetle outbreak in the Appalachian Mountains where about a million acres were impacted. We estimate about $1.5 billion worth of damage in, in, in a five-state area back in um, about 2000, 2001. Uh, the program is administered by U.S. Forest Service um, for cell protection but it's implemented by our 12 state, uh, it's 12 national forests and 13 state partners. Um, the basic tenet of the program is just increasing forest resiliency through good forest management. Then when you should then uh, use prescribed fire, uh, restore areas to uh, native pine species where you can. Um, the, the national forests and states and private landowners have treated about 1.2 million acres so far um, and about 15,000 landowners and loggers have participated in state-run cost share programs. And just to give you an idea of where the, where the treatments have occurred um, and also 
I can't really talk much about the program today, but if you're interested in more in, in the program, you can Google um, Southern Pine Beetle Prevention Story Map, and you can, uh, you'll find this map. This is it's actually a series of maps, um, and then also talks about the program. You can read more about it um, and see the types of treatments that individual states or national forests have done. And you can zoom in on the dots um, and get more information about each one of those treatments. If you take all those dots and put them on this pie chart here, what you get is you see that most of the work has been either pre-commercial thinning or first thinning. And that's the blue, blue parts of the pie there. About 60% uh, of the work has been uh, thinning work, a small part in prescribed burning, and then the rest in restoration. So we really have emphasized thinning as the main tool uh, for trying to miti mitigate the impacts of this insect. Um, on the top right-hand corner is the longleaf pine stand in northern Florida. On the bottom right is a shortleaf pine stand in Arkansas the Watch on the Wachita National Forest. And then up on the left-hand side there is a, a picture that I took last time I was up here um, in the demonstration sites where they were doing some thinning and hope to, to burn uh, here on Long Island. And as Neil mentioned, um, the work that's being done to improve or restore these types of habitat where they're the appropriate pine species or the appropriate pine community, that's really the same type of work that I would be um, recommending for trying to prevent impacts from southern pine beetles. So you have the right tree species for the site, low intensity, more frequent fire as part of your management equation and uh, having a lower stand density or a lower basal area and a fairly open understory is, is a recipe for trying to prevent southern pine beetle um, and also restore your, your native pine communities. And so even though these stands are hundreds of miles apart, they all have those very uh, low hazard, what I would consider low hazard conditions for southern pine beetle. So are we certain that thinning prevents southern pine beetle? And, and I'm very confident in saying yes, it, it, it does. Um, the reason I'm so confident in that is that there's been a ton of studies over the years showing, showing that. Um, some of the, the best work was done by Evan Nebaker and John Hodges in the late 1970s, early 80s, where they were artificially in, introducing southern pine beetle into, into stands with different stand densities, different basal areas. It followed this kind of the spot expansion over a four month period. And uh, they concluded, or the data showed that at, at around 80 square feet of basal area, you really didn't, you had a very low probability of a southern pine beetle spot expanding in those areas. So lower stand density, very unlikely that a spot would, would grow in, in, those, in those forest areas. And they, they did a series of studies, um, just kind of summarizing it here with this this one graph. Also, I was involved in a study uh, in 2013. Uh, two national forests in Mississippi, the Bienville National Forest and Homochitta National Forest, were experiencing a fair amount of southern pine beetle activity. And we went to those two national forests and um, identified where the southern pine beetle spots occurred on the landscape and the type of um, management that had been done in those stands prior to that, and then also the, the stand characteristics, tree age, tree height, and all those kind of things. But basically what we found was that only two of the southern pine beetle, more than 900 southern pine beetle spots, occurred in stands that had been thinned in the past six years. So we initially thought we would be comparing SBB in thin versus unthin stands, but we really couldn't find um, very many stands um, where southern pine beetle had gotten into a thin stand at all. So why does um, thinning prevent southern pine beetle? Well, when I was in forestry school, we talked all about the individual tree vigor, so the faster growing trees, more vigorous, we're able to pitch out those beetles like I showed before. And that, that certainly is true. There's a lot of uh, data to back that up, showing the relationship between uh, pitch flow, the amount of resin available, and um, uh, tree, tree health. 
However, if you when you thin a stand, uh, there's not an immediate response by the tree. So when you thin a stand, there's going to be more sunlight available. Uh, the tree's going to put on more foliage. The tree's going to put on more roots. You're going to the tree will start to grow more, and the resin production will be higher. That's not an immediate overnight response. That's that's a one or two year a delayed response. So we've often recommended in the past that you don't thin during a southern pine beetle outbreak because there's actually a short-term um, stress to those trees, particularly if you're doing it with heavy uh, machinery. However, I think there's another part of the equation about why um, thinning works to prevent southern pine beetle. And that is um, the change in your stand structure following a thinning is maybe more important, I, th I believe, than the individual tree resistance. And uh, Gary and Koster uh, did this study where they, in the center of each one of these plots was a, an infested tree, and they looked at the adjacent trees at various distances from the initially infested um, tree from five feet up to 25 feet. And what they found was that once you reach somewhere between 15 feet and 20 feet, um, southern pine beetle no longer went from the initially infested tree to your adjacent trees. So there's kind of a magic distance there where you won't, you won't have that spot expansion. And they, they uh, Jack Koster um, rep repeated this study during an infestation, and he showed that as tree spacing changed, the probability of a spot expanding in those um, areas drastically decreases. So, like 10 percent, you know, once you get to about that six meter mark or about 20 feet, um, you're unlikely to have spot expansion in those, in those forests. And we've seen this in the real world. Um, we do a lot of something called row thinning in the south, where you do reduce your basal area, but you leave these rows. Um, and we've seen where southern pine beetle get into these stands and they'll work right down the row because the spacing is still maybe eight to 10 feet, but they won't jump across the row. Um, it's, it's pretty weird. But um, if you do your um, thinning by spacing, which we really uh, strongly encourage, you don't, you don't see that. Um, and I think this is in part due to that pheromone communication system that the southern pine beetle have. Harold Thistle and Brian Strom did some work where they looked at, um, they released a tracer gas in, in forests with different densities. Um, it was kind of a complicated study here. I won't get too down on the weeds here. But they put these sensors up throughout the forest and released this tracer gas and watched where it went. And you can see that there's a big difference in the canopy of a high density stand, like on the left, basal area 140 versus basal area 70 on the right and how that openness of the, um, of the uh, stand structure there. And they released this gas, and they watched how it, how it moved through the stand. And they concluded that in these um, more dense stands, a lot more understory, that pheromone plume just sat in those stands, or the, the tracer gas just sat in those stands. It'd be more easy for the incoming beetles to kind of identify the point source or be able to, there's a lot higher concentration of the gas in those stands. Versus in a more open stand with less understory, more lights hitting the ground, causing thermal updrafts, more wind flow through, it, through the stand, um, basically blew that, the tracer gas right out of that stand, right out the top, and uh, would make it very difficult for incoming beetles to really identify where that southern pine southern pine beetle pheromone source was coming from. So our thinning recommendations are um, thinning will certainly prevent southern pine beetle. Thin, consider thinning by spacing at that 20 foot um, distance after your um, thinning is uh, finished. And then also um, think about creating an open understory in conjunction with your thinning work. One of the best ways to create an open understory is, is either through mechanical means or through prescribed fire. And um, 
Traditionally, entomolo forest entomologists really haven't recommended prescribed fire uh, in the same words with preventing southern pine beetle. Either it didn't have an effect or there was some worry that maybe you were stressing the trees. But I think when you think about the change in stand structure being more important than individual tree uh, vigor, um, I think prescribed fire can be part of a, a prevention practice for SPB. Um, it can reduce the competing vegetation and your stand basal area, uh, reducing tree stress and, and changing that stand structure. Low intensity fire is part of these ecosystems, you know, short leaf pine or pitch pine, or long leaf pine, it's part of that ecosystem. Um, some, I get some blowback when I, when I say that, so I always say maybe be cautious when you're using prescribed fire um, to prevent southern pine beetle, but I think there's some fairly strong evidence that suggests that it is a valuable part of managing against this insect. Because if you think about these two stands, the basal area in these two stands is probably fairly, is somewhat similar. But there's a big difference, I think, between the stand on the left and the stand on the right and how you think that pheromone plume would sit in those two stands. The one on the left, I would suggest that the pheromone plume is going to blow right out of there versus the one on the right would be more likely to kind of sit in that type of environment. One study, and there's not very many studies that have looked at southern pine beetle and prescribed fire, um, somewhat disagrees with what, what I just said, and that is uh, one done by Scott Cameron and Ron Billings back in the 80s, where they had southern pine beetle on the landscape in Texas, and uh, they looked at where those southern pine beetle spots occurred, burns, burned areas versus unburned areas. And what they found was that where they had done, where prescribed burn had, burning had been done, there were more southern pine beetle spots than where it hadn't been done. Now, one thing I will point out is um, they were looking at stands from eight years of age to 15 years of age, and I would argue that um, that's fairly young to be, to be burning in. We don't do a lot of that, um, and if you compare that, I, I don't think that compares well to, say, burning in a 25-year-old stand or a 30-year-old stand. And the reason I say that is we, we did... Um, that study that I talked about earlier in Mississippi, where we looked at where southern pine beetle occurred on the landscape, we found exactly the opposite of what Cameron and Billings did. And um, if a stand had been burned previously, we had less southern pine beetle. If a, if a stand had been uh, burned more recently, we had less southern pine beetle. And if a stand had been burned more frequently, we had less southern pine beetle. Uh, in, the, in those areas, and we were looking at and we were looking at stands from 12 years of age to 45 years of age. So a larger window of age classes, um, a lot more stands. Um, <clears throat> and so this is really there's only really two studies that talk about southern pine beetle and prescribed fire. Those are the two studies. Um, I think that this work certainly there's an opportunity to to replicate this work and. and see how it works on in other areas and, and what other folks might, might find. But uh, I think this data is fairly strong, but again, I think it needs to be replicated. So should you thin or burn during an outbreak? The answer to this has always been no, but um, there's more of us that are starting to say, well, maybe cautiously consider thinning and burning during an actual southern pine beetle outbreak because that change in stand structure is probably more important than the individual tree vigor. Uh, one example of this that, that I uh, personally got to see was this stand here. We were uh, doing that study in Mississippi, and we were walking to this particular southern pine beetle spot. And the, we walked from the road into the stand, and the first part of the stand from the road into the spot had, had been thinned um, in the past month. And... Um, you get to a creek, and, and the equipment that was doing the thinning work couldn't get across the creek. And the spot was right on the other side of that creek, and the spot ran down to the creek. The beetles would have been able to jump the creek very easily, but none of the trees in the thinned area had been impacted. The spot just stopped right there at the thinned, uh, where the thinning started. Even though that thinning had been done 
you know, during the active uh, infestation. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and, and call it and say thank you for your attention.